the side of uh, morality, actually, how far you can you can take this this chain of of even selective breeding because obviously we're a chicken farmer and we have laying chickens, which is which is one thing. And they they're semi naturally lay like that. If you apparently the the whole idea of what they lay eggs every day is because they used to not lay eggs and every 20 or not so many eggs. And then every 25 years, they'd have a mass drop of bamboo seeds, apparently, uh, which they need to take advantage of. So what they do is if they'd get a hit of protein um, over the generations that they evolved, they, they basically start laying eggs on mass. So apparently then if we, that's why we feed them protein diets with soy and things like this, um, which is a, which is a separate argument in itself, but um, that, in, that basically tricks them apparently, or did when we first domesticated them into thinking that this was the bumpy year. Uh, and then they start laying loads of eggs. So that that's our side. So now they, we, that's semi-natural, but we used to do broilers as well. And I've seen broilers in America in particular, which is even worse when they've gone to such a stage where their muscles grow so fast and they're so, and they're, they can't really walk and they've, you know, they're, they're lying down. They're so fat. They can barely move because they've got so much muscle on them. Is there, is there a moral problem there? Do you think that we've potentially gone too far? Because when you look at that, it's, it's hard to reconcile that life, which obviously it's natural now because it's only a matter of selective breeding that like we've selected the, the, the fattest the most muscly, so on and so on. But now with that chicken, it doesn't only really have a fantastic life, even if it's free range, it doesn't really move a lot because it's so big. I don't know if there's a, if there's a stage in which we even, even in that sense need to recognize that we've probably gone too far in, in, as you've said, if, if the, if the command was to subdue the earth, it's, it's gone a little bit beyond what we should be on doing, especially for something which is sentient in one sense. Well, I should probably use a better word than subdue because uh, uh, <laughs> connotation. <laughs> is it like caretaker? Was it what's it? What, there was something like a, yeah, a was, uh, manage. Yeah. It was uh, so Adam was a gardener. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you read <laughs> the account of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, Mary mistook him for a gardener, uh, as in may, man was made to make the earth better. Um, and that includes also not just getting the best out of animals, but also why are you doing that? Looking after them. Mm. Um, yeah, I can't remember the passage in Proverbs that says a good man looks after his animals, uh, doesn't abuse them. And um, so it goes without saying that, well, it should. But subduing the earth means looking after and getting the best out of the animals, the land, the vegetation that God has given us charge over and not abusing uh, these things. So, you know, there's that kind of abuse of animals on large scale, far, through large scale farming. But it's also things like, you know, how people even abuse their pets. And that's people that do that are often shown to be psychopaths or sociopaths uh, in life. So it does have a moral aspect to it uh, in that if you follow the commandments carefully of subduing the earth, it means that you're actually looking after your animals well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I mostly ask, I mean, it may not be what you're, what you're comfortable with, but I mostly ask simply because I think a lot of the people who might listen to this are maybe looking for spiritual guidance in what they do, given that they're a rural population. And obviously, as I said at the beginning, that means it's a significantly higher percentage that they'll be, uh, they may be, might be religious. And yet I think because it's become so unfashionable to ask, it's it's sort of one of those things that you know it would be a bit strange i think if, if a local farmer came to you and asked you for spiritual guidance on whether they should be farming chickens that have grown too fat for themselves and you know what i mean and it's and so i only ask simply because i think a lot of people might be thinking it particularly listeners of this show because um you know it is it is a strange feeling when you're a farmer with animals which may not be which don't seem to be enjoying life and, and you're doing it because you've got to pay bills because you've got to, you know, you've got a family to feed. You've got to, you've got to have an occupation. You can't do much else. You've, you've got no money to be able to venture into other business ideas. 
uh, and so yeah. on. And I think that's why it's an important question to ask for people who are basically in that situation. It, it doesn't have to be chickens. It can be anything. You know, it can even be oil seed rape, which is obviously, you know, oil production, plant oil, which is really, really, really bad for biodiversity because they spray it off with pesticides and insecticides. And if you don't, you don't make a profit. So you can either go out of business or you can you can wrestle with this idea that you are damaging in some way God's creation, which they which they believe in. And and as I say, I mean, I don't know what you would think if a farmer came to you and said, um, "Look, Helgas, what do I do about spraying my crops with with pesticides?" I don't, it might be a bit strange in 21st century the UK. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if, if we came with that specific question, I'd be um stuck for words <laughs> and I, I think that's part of the problem though uh, in which where in a sense you have this divide between the rural or the farmers and the urban or people that actually make the laws uh, mm. there seems to be a disjunction between the two and they don't understand each other and often um laws are made that cripple farmers uh, they may have good intentions but they actually cripple the productivity of farmers without appreciating the challenges they have uh it can be as things as controversial as fox hunting whatever your opinion about that is uh i think there's heated debate on uh, and with valid points from both sides uh they need to meet in the middle i think uh, but Again, it's trying to, in subduing the earth, uh, to do the best that you can for the land, for the animals, and especially for the farmers themselves, uh, because uh, it's their livelihood, and they are producing food for the nation. Yeah, yeah, and well, I mean, the the latest, you know, I don't know what you call, what you call it, brainwave, or I don't know, uh, there might be a word, but the latest um, ideas coming from central Westminster, at least for the UK, which may be different in Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland, uh, for people listening up there, is oh, sorry, but that's the phone ring. I unplugged that last time. <laughs> Never mind. I should have done it this time. That's not mine. It's it's the office one. Um, but is that the, the farmers and landowners are not only food producers, but they're also the caretakers of um, public public goods. Because although yes, they have to use they ha they have to be given the control of the land to be able to produce the food for for us. They also uh, are charged with or sort of given the responsibility of upkeeping footpaths and uh, allowing you know habitat to thrive for, for birds for for plants and so on and what they do obviously has more of an effect on on the shape and the outcome of that than someone who's working on a computer who yeah okay may need a may need a mast for their for their connection and so on and that's why i mean it, i'm not going to be the best person to explain what i should do because i used to be I, I used to be a policy advisor but <laughs> ignore over that but the uh the the general gist of it is is that the government will support it as best they can laws which allow them to produce public goods, which isn't necessarily food. So I suppose the the position there from the central um, you know brains is that there needs to be a move away from that what you were saying earlier that farmers are there to produce the food for us to. They're not, I suppose it wouldn't even be farmers as such anymore. Like land carers will be there to look after the countryside for us, which is a huge step in a in different direction. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it's good or not. I haven't really made my mind up yet. I think it's as you get, it's one of those things that seems good on paper, but but you know you could have the reverse of the cat reforms where you had you know butter mountains and and wine mountains to somewhere where you're not in a famine. You've got enough food, but it's just not productive. So you, you've got enough, you've got enough production that's just not producing almost. Yeah. Um, I'm not one to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We can leave it out as a, that's the problem. You leave it, leave it to the, to the brainiacs and end up having problems yeah. that you may have foreseen, but I don't know. Yeah. My, it, it, it appears to me that farming has become difficult in recent times. Uh, but this would appear to make it even more difficult. Uh, yeah, especially to get into. I think that's one of the problems is is it, 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 
it's there's almost there almost needs to be a, like a, a separate bank for agricultural or land enterprises because realistically most of them unless you've got a, a large financial backing behind you require a significant period of time at least you know long you know it, let's say if you were even one of the ideas last week was to produce um hazelnuts and let's take that as one idea i mean it would take establishment time and costs and 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 forfeited revenue and so on of everything for that and your your time frame that you think in in crop rotation is not annual like we've got at the minute it's 150 years and so it's way beyond the human lifetime and certainly beyond someone's lifetime who starts farming at 30 even if and most people would start farming probably later because it would take them a significant amount of time to build up the capital to be able to buy the land and then you've got to be able to have the capital to afford to establish and so on i think if there was a specialized financial institution which would be able to support those wanting to try these new ideas out which which basically go go beyond a single person's lifetime which would be hard i'm not a financier so i don't know how that's going to work and i wouldn't dare to suggest how it might work but if there was some a way of getting around that i think it'd be a lot more helpful for 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 longer term thinking because you know land doesn't doesn't work around the 70 year 80 year time frame of human life really no um and i suppose there's always this thing about uh do you want your farmers to do one thing and do it well or do you want them to just do everything and do it sort of mediocre yeah 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 i think that's almost, i don't know because i i should probably stop mentioning the indian farmer protest simply because i'm so ignorant on it it's it'd probably be an embarrassment to start mentioning it i really would like someone to come on if there's if i've got a couple of indian listeners on here so if they're if they're listening in and you know anything about that please get hold of us and yeah tell us about that because i think it's almost exactly what you're talking about is uh, uh, this is my bad explanation is that the indian government made a load of reforms that was supposed to uh, help with these things about la- allowing farmers to do do a lot more things but not as well almost and stop producing food and be a solely food producer um which obviously for them for a lot of this i think it's the smallest the smaller landowners in indian provinces which are protesting given that their business has now become inviolable because if they're not 100 percent maximum producing as much as they can off their small plot of land they, they go out of business yeah so i almost think that's exactly case in point over there which is, which is what's just happened and it, it's ridiculous yeah. the size of that protest given that something like two hundred fifty thousand um tractors let alone people i mean obviously two or three people to a tractor yeah yes i mean and well we'd never have anything like that here i don't think we'll <laughs> see but i don't think you'd manage to get the the people of bledington up and on tractors going down to london but <laughs> uh, <too English> <laughs> yeah maybe write a letter <laughs>